we're going to finish up a little bit of work that we didn't quite finish in the last lecture. And um, we're going to do some uh, mid-semester exam revision. So let's step through the uh, some admin things. First of all, the mid-semester exam. Uh, there's some logistics here. I'm going to put a piazza post. Make sure you're watching piazza. I'll provide more details there. There are three things I really want you to know. The last one's pretty obvious. You need to know when the... Oops, <laughs> the date's wrong on that. Okay, so this, this is next Monday. So I think you all know that. It's next Monday, Monday week six. I forgot to update that. It's not 29th of March. It's uh, whatever the date is. It's, it's in August. Okay, so next Monday is the exam. And um, what is that date? Um... Well, let's let's have a quick look. Let's go to the let's go to our course webpage, uh, which is always uh, uh, going to tell us where this is. Let's go here, mid semester exam, and we can see here it is um, at one o'clock on Monday of week six. All right, and that tells you there it's Monday thirtieth of August. All right, now we go back to here, and because I don't want people to be completely confused, we'll just change that. Oops, and if I can just type. Okay, sorry about that folks. Sorry for getting that typo wrong, I just uh, forgot. All right, um, the other two things I really want to go through are uh, this tech check and self invigilation okay? First of all, the tech check. This is a really important idea, it's here for you. Your tutors and myself are gonna take time out from our schedules to help you guys have a successful exam. What you do not wanna have happen is at the start of the exam, at one o'clock on Monday, that you panic because you don't know how to get access to the exam or your internet setup, you've forgotten how to do it or something like that. You don't want those sort of technical issues. What you really want is that Monday, when that exam starts, you can just sit there, press a button, get your exam and start working on the exam. You don't want to be messing around with the technology, right? That's the, that's the message. So what we've done, um, we, did, we, did this, uh, we did this last year as well. We did this um, last year at the end of the year exam and it worked really successfully. What we're doing is we're having a tech check, and this year we're doing two. The reason why we're doing two is because of the times. You see the 12 hours apart. One is at 9 p.m. in the evening, this coming Sunday, um, and the other one is 9 a.m. on Monday, okay? The reason why the 12 hours apart is because we've got people all, literally all around the world doing this course. And if we just said 9 a.m. on Monday, there'd be people who'd have to get up at three o'clock in the morning to do that, or even worse, okay? So we're giving you two opportunities, one on Sunday evening and one on Monday morning. And because they're 12 hours apart, everyone, wherever you are in the world, should be able to attend one of those two opportunities. What's gonna happen is during that tech check, it's gonna be just like the real exam, except there's no stress because there's no marks or anything like that. You'll go to the exam server, you'll clone your repo just like you did for the lab exam, and in there will be a question. And it, instead of being called Q1, it'll be called P1 for practice question one. And it's just gonna be the friendly old hello world question you did way back in week one, okay? And, but the point is you go there and you do that, fill in the hello world, it's just one line, right, hello world. You save it, you run the test in your IntelliJ, make sure it passes, which it should, right? And then when you're done with that, you commit it, then you push it, then you go look at that exam server and make sure that the CI is, uh, um, is, um, has accepted your thing and that everything's working, all right? So the ba basic idea is you get to check all the technology out on Sunday night or Monday morning, okay? And when it comes time for the exam on Monday afternoon, all you need to do is open up IntelliJ and do pull. When you do pull, it will get you the actual exam. All right, so what you get on Sunday, Monday is a small version of the exam which has one practice question in it, which is just hello world and has tests and CI and all that sort of stuff, but just for one practice question, okay? Um, and then, then when the actual exam happens, you just hit a button to pull, you IntelliJ, you say pull, and you'll get your full exam, all right? Now, if you have any questions about that, you should put them in the chat and Leo can relate them to me if he can't answer them directly. The other thing that you need to know is we will use self-invigilation. And this is incredibly important, folks. Self-invigilation is described on the course webpage, and it's your way of um, ensuring that you can, you can explain to people that you did the exam with integrity. It is optional, okay? But it's extremely highly recommended. Not only does it provide you with insurance in case someone says to you, look, it looks like you didn't do the right thing in the exam, you can say, hey, here's the video, I did everything right. So that's a really nice guarantee, really nice insurance for you, that's one thing. The other thing is if something else weird happens in the exam, which shouldn't happen, but it can, then you've got a recording of what the weird thing was, right? So maybe you know your computer caught on fire, whatever. Whatever it is, you've, you've got a recording of that as well, okay? so. Um, 
doing this self-invigilation is a really good exercise. You own it, you own the recording, it sits on your computer, we don't, we don't have it, we don't see it, but it means that you can, um, it's an insurance policy if you wanna figure it that way for yourself. And I highly recommend everyone did it. Interestingly enough, when I ran into issues with a, with a lab exam, the students who I had uh, questions about, um, they hadn't done the self-invigilation, which is a great pity for them, okay? So I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you do the self-invigilation. Now, um, it's all explained on the web page. Let me just go there in case anyone's wondering what on earth I'm talking about here. Um, okay, there it is, it's right there. Self-invigilation, okay? So you need to do this. It tells you there how to do it and um, it tells you the details in the final exam about exactly how to do it. It's not that difficult, um, but it's a great idea to test this out. You can test it out during the tech check, right? Make sure during the tech check, everything works. So what I'd highly recommend you do is during the tech check, record yourself, record the entire tech check, and then after the tech check, go and check your recording. Make sure to actually record what you thought it was gonna record. Then, when you do the exam, you know everything's working great, okay? And you can feel really comfortable and relaxed about all that technology stuff. All right, um, one more thing is that um, uh, assignment two is um, fully, uh, is now, the whole assignment is available. I uploaded that a few hours ago, so you can do an upstream pull if you want to get all the details in assignment two, which you, you will need, of course, to finish assignment two. That's now available. You just need to do an upstream pull. Go to Piazza, it tells you how to do it. The important point there is you need to make sure that when you do the upstream pull, you do it the right way because you're doing a group project now. It's not just you. Okay, so the person who owns the group uh, repo will need to be the one, but it's explained on Piazza. I provide a link to the lab. You did it in the lab, and so you should just follow the instructions in the lab. The last thing I want to talk about is perhaps the most important, academic integrity. Next week at ANU is Academic Integrity Week. We take academic integrity seriously, okay? I take academic integrity seriously. It's very important that you understand that. It's very important that you understand what it means. As you're doing assignment one, as you're doing your lab exam, as you're doing the um, mid-semester exam, you need to act with integrity for your own sake and for the sake of your classmates. I know that a very small number of people in this class won't. Usually that happens because people are stressed. Most of you are not bad people, you're all good people. But if you get really stressed, sometimes you do the wrong thing. That's a terrible mistake to make, an absolutely terrible mistake to make because if you do the wrong thing, you will very likely get found out and if that happens, it could have very serious consequences for your enrollment at the ANU, for visas, for all kinds of stuff. Okay, you do not want to go there. It's very important. And ultimately, if that goes on your academic record, your, the rest of your career will have that on the bottom of the record. This person breached academic integrity rules on your record for the rest of your life, okay? You don't want to be there. So let me stress this one more time. I really, really hope I do not have to uh, chase down a whole bunch of people next week because next week will be when I'll be looking at all this stuff. Um, but please, please, please make sure you do the right thing with your assignments and with the exams, okay? And um, I don't know if, I, I, don't, I, I hate belaboring this point because I know 90, 95% of you, 99% of you are not gonna do the wrong thing. And so for you, this is just tedious. But for those of you who are gonna do the right thing, I guess you can feel reassured that we're trying to, in, we're trying to create a culture of people behaving with integrity. And ultimately, what you want to do is you want to graduate and say, hey, I went to ANU. ANU has academic excellence and it has integrity. I went to a place that actually upholds academic integrity. I didn't go to some place where cheats just um, are, are everywhere, okay? And so that's why that culture is important. And it also means I know what integrity is, right? That's, that's something you can say when you graduate. I've learned, I understand what integrity is. I'm a person of integrity. You want to hire me, okay? Because I'm an, a person of integrity. So this is a really important thing for you, for your career. All right, now with that, let's move on. Um, we, I didn't quite finish the, our lecture on recursion. I'm gonna do that as fast as I can, and then we're gonna move on to the, to the mid-semester exam and, and talk through some um, examples there. First of all, recursion. Um, Leo reminded me of one thing I forgot to do, which, which, is, uh, which is a good demonstration of recursion, which is very simple, is show you what happens when I bring up OBS. There it is, OBS. Can you see what happened there? So there I am. Um, now my OBS is on the desktop, which means that it's, uh, it's also over here, which means it's also over here, which means it's also over here, and it's also over there. That's an illustration of recursion, okay? So this is a uh, uh, recursion right here, right now in our, uh, our lecture for you. Um, I didn't think of that. Thank you for reminding me, Leo. 
What we were doing at the end was we were just starting to go through Merge Sort. I just want to remind to you of Merge Sort. First of all, you've got a base case, and in this case, you've got a list of size one. Merge Sort is a recursive algorithm, and it says, if I have a list, the big insight is a very, very simple one. It says, if I've got a list with one element in it, it's already sorted. There's nothing to do. That's the insight. That's a very, very simple insight. And what it also says is, you know what? If there are two lists which are not of size one, and they're both sorted, then actually making one merged list, which is also sorted, is actually really easy to do, okay? And by, with that insight, what it does is it says, let's split lists in half, sort them, and do this recursively until we get down to a list of size one, which we know how to do, and then merge the results, okay? And this, this animation on the right illustrates it. You can see the big list there gets split into two bits. They get split further. They ultimately get split down to lists of size one. So now they're sorted. Each one of those little lists down there is sorted because it's of size one, it's, it's, it's obviously sorted. Then what you do is you combine these little lists and now you've got lists of size two that are sorted because you, combining sorted lists is actually really easy. And then we do the same thing with the list of size two, merging them into lists of size uh, four, and, and on the right there we've got size three. And then finally we merge them all and we get the fully sorted list. And then this is an animation of them. You can see it's progressively making all these unsorted sticks become more and more sorted. Um, excuse me while I drink a little bit more coffee. Like you guys, it's been a very, very torrid start to semester. Okay, so that's a really lovely animation of Merge Sort. Um, before we get to the sample exam, let's finish our merge sort because we didn't finish it off. Okay, so go here. And what we, if, if you remember rightly, what we did is we also taught about test driven development. Okay, test driven development. And we wrote ourselves two tests. We've got a single, uh, sort of single uh, thing. We've got here, we'll run this test. Run this test. Here it goes. And. Um, Okay. Oh, there. Okay, that better? Yeah. Sorry, guys. That's really, thank you for that. Um, uh, is it Ethan? Thank you for that. <clears throat> I did some other recording this morning for something completely different. I guess the settings got adjusted. I apologize for that. Is that, uh, tell me if there's still a problem, folks. All right. So uh, we just ran our test and uh, it failed, of course, because why did it fail? It's because we haven't actually written our sorting algorithm yet. It's just in here. Okay. So that's, that's our sorting algorithm, which does nothing. And we run our other test here. And here's our other test. Okay, and that also fails, which is exactly what we expect. Now, the question now is, how do we implement merge sort? And um, the algorithm is really actually very elegant and simple, as I already explained to you. I showed you an animation. But um, the first, the other thing that, we, that we've done just now before we did recursion was data structures. We learned about lists and you can see they were using a list and it's a list of integer. This particular algorithm is gonna sort integers. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do first is deal with the really simple cases. Okay, so what, what are the most simple cases? Well, first of all, if the list is null, then we just returned, um, we, we, we return whatever we were given, okay? And the other one we can do is if the list is of size one, we also know how to deal with that. We just return that. So let's deal with the most simple case first and start that way. So we'll say if um, unsorted, whoops, sorry, typos here. Uns there's something in my, the way of my fingers. There we go, unsorted. If unsorted um, equals null, so someone gave us an empty list, or um, unsorted dot size, whoops. Now, see, we're using the, oops, typos everywhere. Size, there we go. The size, or the size is the less than or equal to one. So it's a size, a list of size zero or a list of size one. In any case, in all those cases, we just return the unsorted list because the sorted list is the same thing as the unsorted list, right? So we'll just return unsorted, whoops. Okay, hopefully that makes sense, right? So we're just gonna return the list we got in those sim very simple cases. And if we run our tests here, let's, um, where are we? Um, can we run both of them, run? Can run both those tests. No, I need to run them separately. Here we go. If we run this test here, 
Oh, it is. It is doing them both. Okay, look, we've already passed the test. Hooray. This is an important lesson for the mid-semester exam, folks. There are often really simple questions that you can answer and get a small amount of marks. We just wrote that very simple case there, and immediately we passed one test. Be strategic with a mid-semester exam. This is a great example of that. Okay, so we've got ourselves a uh, simple um, case there. Then what we want to do is we want to... Um, uh, can anyone remember what the basic algorithm is going to be here? It's not a list of size one. We've established that, so now it's, it's greater than one. What we want to do now is to split the uh, list into two parts and sort each of those, right? So let's do that. We're going to create um, two le lists, a left list and a right list, okay? And so first of all, we'll find it, we'll, we'll, just to make it easy, we'll just say what the size is here. In size equals um, unsorted.size, like that. So now we know the size, and then we'll say um, list of integer um, u left, unsorted left, equals, um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a sublist out of the unsorted list. We'll say unsorted dot sublist, and we'll go from zero to um, size on two, right? So that's going to take the lower part of the list. And then we'll do the opposite for um, the other, right? And we'll say uh, the, the right, okay? You write like that. And then we'll just say um, equals unsorted dot sublist uh, size on two. Okay? And because the first thing is inclusive and that's exclusive, this all works just right. So now we have two unsorted sublists. So we broke our list into two parts, a left part and a right part. And the U just stands for unsorted, okay? So now what we want to do is to make them sorted. How do we do that? How do we sort the left and the right? This is the interesting part of recursion. We, what we do is we just pretend that we've got merge sort already working. We haven't, obviously, because we're writing it right now. But let's just imagine we've got, got it already working. If it's already working, then we can sort the left and the right using merge sort. So let's do that. Okay, so we'll say list <coughs> integer, oops, sorted left equals merge sort of unsorted left, right? So the, a sorted version of the left hand is equal to a merge sorted, is gained by calling merge sort on the unsorted version. We can do the same for the right. Um, sorted right equals equals merge sort of unsorted right. Okay, so now we're creating two sorted lists. So we've got now two sorted lists, and we know that it's actually in principle really easy to combine two sorted lists. I want you to think about this. You may want to do it, you know, with your fingers or whatever um, at home to convince yourself of how this works or do put dots on, on bits of paper or whatever or, or, or you know scrabble pieces or something to, to try this out but if you've got a sorted list here and a sorted list here what you really want to do is you want to move through um, so you start off with the lowest one on um, say the highest one on this side and you slide it across until it fits in its right place there okay so that one's now in there say and then you take the next one and so forth and you keep moving like that until all of them are in place Okay, and the way we do that is we'll, we'll have a cursor which will tell us which one, where each one is up to. And you want to make sure you work through all of the ones on the right and all the ones on the left. Okay, so we've got two little cursors which are counting where we're up to here. And once you've exhausted all those and exhausted all of those and put them in place, then, you, um, then you're done. All right, so what we're going to do is create some uh, variables here. Um, so we can just uh, L, that's our position for the left and int r equals zero. And then we want a place to put our results, okay? So the way we're gonna do that is we're just gonna put that in a, in, in a, in a list too, okay? So we'll say um, list integer result equals new array list, like that, okay? So we're gonna pop our results into there when, when we're done. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna slide the left and the right until both of them are exhausted. So we'll say while l is less than um, s left dot length dot size, like that. Um, or right is less than uh, sorted right dot size. Keep working our way through. Okay, so we're going to keep working our way through here. And um, uh, so we're, we've got these two things pointing, initially pointing both to the start 
of the respective sorted, the left and the right, so they're both pointing to the start, and they're gonna wind their way through until they both get to the end of the respective things. Now, let's look at the first two elements, the, the, the first element of the, of the right and the first element of the left, and whichever one is the smaller of the two gets put into the result, okay? And then we advance that one, and we keep applying that rule. So we'll say, um, if uh, s um, right dot um, get r is less than s left dot get l, okay, then what that means is uh, the right hand side has the smaller element. Okay, so that's what that's telling us. So we're the, the right hand pointer is pointing to the smaller one. So we want to grab that one out, increment r, and we put that one into the array. So we'll say result, um, result.add, um, sorted right, dot get, dot get, get right. So that's the one we just got. We're going to add that into the, into the results and we're going to increment r. Okay? And then we're just going to do the same thing um, on the left, like this. So we say, um, if it wasn't that one, we'll take it out of the left, okay? So if the right one was not the smaller, then they're either equal to or, or, or great, um, then the left, either the left one is um, the smaller one or they're the same, in which case it doesn't matter which one we take, okay? So either way, we'll add the left one, okay? So let's do that. Oops. Oops. Result.add um, s left dot get oh my left dot get l and then increment that l pointer okay and so slowly the l and the r are working their way through and I'll hang on I've got to increment it l plus plus like that and ultimately um, they're just winding their way through it here and when they're both exhausted then we will have put all of the things in the result array okay. And at that point, we can just return the result. Okay, we're nearly done, but this needs a little bit more care um, here. We need to think a little bit more about these conditions because we need to think about the case where, where um, there's nothing left in the right because we've already exhausted it, okay? So um, we don't want to try and take something out of the right if the right is already exhausted. So we say if r is um, less than s right dot size like that and that's true okay um, let's just think this through if the okay let's just think this through so if there's still some stuff on the right to grab and the thing on the right is less than the thing on the left, then we'll add the thing on the right. So let's just test this, see how we go. I think we're done. Nope, we made a mistake. Let's see what happened here. Did not sort list of size six. Oh my, what happened here? Um, Okay, we've got, a, we've got a problem here, folks. Let's just see what happened. So we ex we're expected to get this. Where's our actual test here? Uh, there it is, we got this. And the only thing we put in there was three. So I made some mistake there. Um, what have I done? I think that looks right. So we're gonna keep going around here while one or the other. And let's just say if R is less than Oh, um, no, what else have I done wrong here? Let's just see what's wrong here. Step in. Oh, in the while loop, my goodness. Yeah, I put that line in the wrong place. Oh yeah, thank you, Ethan. Did everyone see what happened there? That was a typo, <laughs> and I couldn't even see it. So I, I put this line here up the line above, which meant that it was always trying to return the result. I meant to have it down here. Thank you, Ethan. Ethan's helped me out twice today.
Okay, we've got another problem now, which is okay. All right, so now what we've got is um, we've got a, a bug here on line 27, and this is what I was worried about. I thought I might be making a mistake here. So, okay, so if we're, um, what, okay, so what's happened here is the index one is out of bounds for length one. Okay, so we've got an array of size, um, uh, okay, we've got it down to, oh, I see. So we've got, we've got a, an array of size one and we're trying to access index one, which means we're going beyond where we should. Okay, let's just think about this for a minute. We're checking the size of R, but what happens if L is, L, we've incremented L, we've exhausted L. So now L is at the end, so L is done. So L is, no, that's no longer true for L. Well, this will fail here, right? This will fail because we'll be trying to get the element out of L beyond the end of L, okay? So, um, what we need to do here is say, if L, um, if L is um, greater than or equal to S L, L dot size, or that, then, or that condition, then we add it, okay? So we need to, we can't go and go and look inside of L if we've already exhausted L. Because if we do that, we'll get the exact error we just saw there. So now let's run this again. Run the merge sort. Hooray, we're done. Okay, so with that, we've built ourselves merge sort, a classic sorting algorithm. Let's just run through it very quickly one more time. First of all, the base cases, if there's nothing to sort, then we're done, okay? So if it's a size, or if it's an array of size one, we're done, okay? Second of all, we um, split the thing into two. So we create two sublists, the, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Then we go and sort them. Bizarrely enough, we sort them using the algorithm which we're writing, which is interesting, okay? That's a very important part. This is where we do the recursion, okay? We create sorted versions of the left and the right, and then what we do is we walk through the left and the right until they're both exhausted, moving whichever one is a lower into the results. So we're always looking for the lowest, lowest one on either the left or the right side, comparing the left and the right. And we're comparing the left and the right here, but before we do that, we've got to make sure we haven't, um, there's still stuff left in the right-hand side to, to do, and there's still, hand, still stuff in the left-hand side, because if there's nothing left in the right-hand side, then we must do this. If there's nothing left in the left-hand side, we must do this, okay? And we're done. With that, it's time to move on to the exam. And um, it's, uh, let me step you through the exam. Um, I already, in the admin section, gave you some advice, um, reminded you it's really important to do the tech check, reminded you academic integrity is incredibly important and self-invigilation is your insurance policy. And um, then I just now wanna step you through it. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna be just like your um, lab exam, you will do a clone from the, um, you'll do a clone from the uh, exam server, uh, from your account, just like the lab exam, and pull that into IntelliJ. When you do your tech check, you'll do that, and you'll get one question there, and that'll be, hello world. Very easy, just fill that in and test it. Make sure that works, and once you've got all that working, and you've managed to push it back to the exam server, and you've got the CI results, you know everything is great. At that point, you need to, um, th then the exam server will shut down, and then when the exam starts, at that point, you do a pull. Please remember, do not try to pull from the exam server or log into the exam server before you are told to. Because as a security measure, GitLab automatically has a shutout, a lockout. If you try repeated attempts to log in when you're blocked, it will lock you out for 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And I can't undo that, okay? So if you go log in, log in, log in like that, you'll get locked out and I won't be able to undo it. So you're gonna have a late start to the exam. So don't do that, okay? So wait until I say go. And when I say go, you can log in, all right? And in, in, in the case of the, um, the pool, that means you can do the pool. But if you keep hitting the thing before I tell you to, you have every chance that GitLab will automatically lock you out. And then just you're just gonna have to wait for 10 minutes. All right, so you don't wanna do that. All right, um, then, oops, that's not where we wanna go. Let's have a look at what you get. I went and forked it here. I forked it and cloned it here. There it is. So what this is, folks, this is a sample exam from the previous year. First of all, you see here a bunch of question ones. You've got a whole bunch of variations on question one. You've got a bunch of variations on question two and a bunch of variations on question three and question four, okay? I suggest you use these as a study device um, and use them wisely, okay? Use them wisely as a study device. Um, now what I'm gonna do is very quickly try to go through um, question, oops, oh man, is, 
did I write a solution? I already wrote a solution there. I didn't mean to do that. I, I guess I was just working, doing that for fun. I put a solution in there, I guess. Um, that was accidental. Let me try and do below here. We'll do this together. Um, and uh, the, the idea, of course, is that we, we'll work it through together. Now, if we're in a real lecture theater, I'd have you shouting out questions. But what you can do is like Ethan did in the, in the last one. If you see me make a mistake, or you have any questions about why I'm doing something, please ask on the chat and Leo will um, voice it and, and I'll try and respond, okay? So let's start here with this, this double. First of all, read the question, okay? Take time to read the question. It's foolish to start typing before you've properly understood the question. The earlier questions are pretty easy to understand. The later ones get more complicated. If you look here, there's a lot to read, okay? That, you have to sit there and read that. Make sure you understand the problem before you, before you um, start, start writing, okay? The exam that you're gonna be doing will be similar. The other thing, in case you haven't noticed it, and I have said this before, I'll say it one more time, the questions are not of equal difficulty. Question one is substantially easier than question four. Question two is a little bit uh, more involved than question one. Question three is in the middle in terms of difficulty. I expect everyone in this class to be able to do question one and question two and get 50, okay? I expect many people to be able to get question three and get something like 75 or 60. Okay, I expect only a few to get question four out. Okay, so please understand that's my expectation. If you if you come out of that exam and say, oh man, I only got out two questions, it's like that's okay, that's a pass. All right, you you've passed the exam. If you got two questions, if you got ten marks out of twenty, you've passed the exam. That's okay. All right, if you come out of the exam and you you say, oh, I only got three quarters out, that's that's a distinction. Okay, that's a great result. Okay. And if you got more than 70, uh, more than 15 um, marks out of 20, you're in HD territory and you should be extremely happy with that, okay? So please understand this exam is progressively harder and budget your time carefully. Let's go down here. Did you ask something, Leo? No. Uh, yeah, um, there's a question in the chat. What resources are we allowed to use during the, the, the exam? You should not need to use any external resources. You must not use any communication. You must not chat with anyone and you should invigilate this yourself and record it. You must not chat with anyone. You should not need to do anything. IntelliJ should give you everything you want. I know someone said, oh, I, did, I, I didn't know which uh, scanner to import. Well, you know, IntelliJ, just, if you just type scanner like that, you can see it's on the screen right away. That should give you everything you need. Um, besides that, the only other thing that you're permitted to do is to do a search on um, the Oracle Java Docs. Um, for Oracle Java Docs. If you type Java Docs Oracle and then something, you can do that. But I highly recommend you don't do that because if you're opening a browser, that immediately opens the, the question about whether or not you're, um, you, and you're doing searches, that, that immediately opens up a whole lot of questions about academic integrity. So you shouldn't have to use extra resources, um, but, um, and, and bear in mind folks, that these exams were normally set before COVID in a closed environment. So it's a closed book exam, all right? So, um, so let me clarify that question, okay? Actually, I, I, this is a closed book exam, it always has been. I don't know why I said that you can search for the Oracle Java Docs. I just mentioned earlier, everything you need to know is actually here inside of IntelliJ. You go here and, um, and, and it's there and you, you, can, you, know, you can get more information about it here and so forth, right? Um, so please just stay inside IntelliJ. The only thing you should be using the browser for is to access the exam server. So, Ignore what I said a minute ago about uh, looking for Java Docs. That's true for the assignment, right? I was confused in answering that. Um, you should not need to do anything other than use IntelliJ. And that's how every student who sat this exam in the past has done it. They've done it in, uh, except for last year in COVID. Before COVID, every student sat this in a lab exam and all they had was uh, the IntelliJ, which is actually a very rich environment. Hopefully that answered the question. Now let's get on and do this because we're going to run out of time, folks. Um, what we want to do is return the average of array elements that are less than the threshold value. What's the threshold value? It says if the array is of size zero or null, there are or there are no elements to average. There's nothing there. Um, then return zero. Okay. And then it says here, um, and, and then the input is an array of double values. And then the threshold is only count of array elements smaller than this value, okay? So let's start off, and the most strategic thing to do first of all is look at the simple cases. It says if it's small or size zero or is null, then return zero, or if there's nothing there. So let's just do that straight away. Say if, if um, values,
What is it? What are we going to return? We're going to, we're going to return zero. All right. All right. So now let's just run that test. Okay. So this one is, what is it? Below. We're going to run the below test here. Let's do that. And we should find that we've passed one test at least, I, I hope. Right. But the, the point here is that doing something simple like that may get you marks straight off the bat. Okay. Oh, what happened? Oh my goodness. All right, I have somehow or other got the wrong version here or something. This is, oh man, this is so annoying. Um, what have I done? I'm sorry, folks. It's strange because I thought I had tested all this before the lecture. Just bear with me. Oh, this is, what What have I done? Sorry, folks, just give me a second here. We're going to try and fix this on the spot because I did not want to waste your time. Now, ah, uh, that's probably just the wrong version. Okay, yeah. All right, sorry, folks. I think I've just cloned the wrong version. So let me, I'm going to have to fix this right now. Right, just bear with me. I apologize. I thought I, 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 Thought I had tested this settings general. I'm going to have to delete this exam, delete the whole thing here, delete the project. All right, this is this is just my little clone that I made, but I must have cloned it last year. I thought I cloned it um, this week, but that's I forked it this week. So now what we're going to do here is we're going to go to Comp 11.10 here, Comp 11.10, and we're going to go to extra. And we're going to go to the mid-semester exam here. There it is. Uh, Comp 1110. You guys wanted to see wanted to see this anyway, I guess. Um, and then what we're going to do here is fork. Now I can see 96 of you have already forked it. That's healthy. We fork this now. I'm going to fork it and put it in my my account here. And then we're going to have to go back to IntelliJ and kill this whole thing because it's just a total mess. I'm sorry, folks. And we'll go back to here and we're going to say um, IntelliJ um, git. Uh, and I have to do something else. I've got to start up my VPN. I'm sorry, folks. Um, and then we're going to go to IntelliJ and we're going to import from Windows here. Yep, I've killed it there. So now we're going to say git, um, um, oh, sorry, file new project from um, version control. And I'm using SSH here. You probably shouldn't, you're probably just using HTTPS, it's, um, which is what most of you are doing. But um, I am using SSH, so you will do this part differently. There we go. We clone this. And that already exists. Um, so we'll just say new in there. Oh, uh, it couldn't resolve it. Oh my goodness. Let me just try one more time. The problem there is probably, uh, oh boy, my um, VPN died, which is not what we want. Oh, let me just do one more thing to test this. Sorry, folks, I did not want you to, um, oh man. Um, Oh, great, the, the, the VPN is dying, dead peer, okay. All right, with a bit of luck now, it might work. Um, try again. There we go, it worked. Sorry, I just have to mess around with the VPN to get it to behave nicely. All right, this time we might be in better shape. We'll start all over. There's our exam. And we're going to go to, what was it? We we're doing below. Is that right? There we are. We already went through this. Let's try and fix this up. So then we say if, um, what was it? If the, so if the um, value is zero, so say values, 
equals null. Or values dot length equals um, zero. Then we return. What do we return? We return zero. Return zero. Okay. So let's just run this now. Um, and what is it below? Run the below test. <clears throat> it's just running the test there. Instantiating the tests. There we go. And so you see there, we've already got two marks out of five. That's what I really wanted to emphasize to you all, is just doing something as simple as that helps us. Now what we want to do is actually do the more substantive part of the question. It says return the average of the elements that are less than the threshold value. So what that means is we're going to go through the array. If the element is less than the threshold value, then we want to count it and sum it. We want to count how many are less than the threshold and we need to sum them all up. Once we've summed them all up, we'll divide them by how many we counted. So let's do that. So we'll say, um, we can just use, there's many ways to do this, but let's just say um, int, um, int, um, uh, what do we call it, below? We'll call it b equals zero. Int b equals zero, that's the ones that are below. Um, int uh, double um, sum, equals zero. So now we've got uh, a sum and a count of how many are below the sum, how many are below the threshold. And then we'll say for um, double v in values, we're going to go through all those values. And we're going to say um, if v is less than the threshold, then we're going to do, um, we're going to increment the number we've got, so b plus plus. And we're going to add it to the sum. Sum plus plus equals v. All right, so now our sum is equal to all the things there. What we can do now, and I won't do the return in the wrong place like I did for the merge sort, that was a silly mistake. What we can do now is we can just return um, the, uh, the average. We say return uh, sum divided by b. All right, now we run our test again, and hopefully we got through it. Now I just chose that below pretty much randomly. I was gonna do above, except that it was filled in because I had the wrong repo. Oops, what have I done? What have I done wrong? Expected zero, but got, oh, oh, okay, all right, oh. Of course, what mistake did I make? There could be none that are below the threshold. If none are below the threshold, then what's gonna be the value of B? b will be zero and we can't do division by zero here okay so let's um check for that we'll say um it says that right here um if there are no elements then return zero so there are no elements below the threshold so we'll say um return b uh we'll, well, let's make it explicit so everyone can follow what i'm doing instead of do fancy stuff we'll say if um b is equal zero return then return zero because that's what it tells us to do up here otherwise then we return the average because you can't take you can't otherwise you get a divide by zero error there you can't divide something by zero you get infinity which it says not a number that's what that stands for run this now and we should be passing all the tests okay very important to read these error messages and, and that gives you a clue as to what's going on okay we passed all the tests awesome now on in on um piazza someone asked about elephant okay let's step through this hopefully i can do this pretty quickly and then someone asked about uh, jigsaw. Let's do jigsaw as well, okay? So we'll start with elephant. Um, what's going on here? Uh, this is a class that represents an elephant. It's got a name and an age, cool. Um, and then we've got to do the constructor. So what are we gonna do in this constructor? Well, we're given our name, we're given an age. We need to set this elephant's name and this elephant's age. You all should be able to do this. You should all know how to do this very, very well now. You say this dot name equals name this dot age equals age. By the way, as soon as we finish that last question, we should push it and commit it. It's very important to do things incrementally, folks, and then just get on with the next question. Don't sit and wait for that CI, just get on with the next question, but push the one you did before, okay? So keep pushing and committing each time you get something done, all right? And now here, um, uh, so we did that. Let's just run this test now. And we may even get marks just for doing that, okay? That was super simple. I don't know if we'll get marks for that, but let's just see. Um, okay, fantastic. We just got a mark from typing that in. 
super simple. All right, now we've got to return the elephant's age. Well, the age is this age field, so we just all we have to do is type this. As simple as that, return the age. It just says return the elephant's age. How easy is that? Okay, now we need to set the age given this one. Well, that's also easy. We just type this.age equals age, right? So we're setting this elephant's age with that argument there. So this age is equal to the age that got passed to us, okay? All right, now let's keep going. Um, let's, well, let's just see if we've got, um, I, I, I'm assuming we'll get another test out of that. Then, um, great, okay? So we got another test, we, we're, we're two down now. Now it says, um, calculate how many years this elephant is likely to live. Life expectancy of this elephant in years, the remaining number of years it's gonna live. Okay, so that's pretty easy. That's just gonna be their, the life expectancy of elephants, so, so maybe it's like, you know, 50 years, and this elephant's 20, so it's got 30 more years to live. So that's pretty easy. We'll just say, um, what is it, life expectancy minus age, like that. Let's see if we get something there, and we'll move on. Keep moving, don't wait for that result, just keep moving. Um, and then, we've got to make the elephants, okay? This is often called a factory method, okay? So it says return an array of elephants using names and ages. Someone's going to give us a pile of names and a pile of ages, and we've got to return a pile of elephants. That's the basic idea, all right? So, um, first of all, and it says here, null if the length of the provider arrays are different, or if they are null, or if they have no elements. Okay, so that's easy. So we say if, let's just do the simple stuff first, okay? Names equals null or ages equals null, or um, the length is not equal, is that what it said? Well, if they have no elements. So if um, uh, names.length is not equal to ages.length, or names.length equals zero. We don't need to say ages.length equals zero because we've already established at this point in the, in the question that they're equal. And if they're not equal, it, it quits anyway. So if all any of those things happen, then we return null. Is that what we return? Yeah, we return null if, um, if any of those things happen. Okay, cool. So now what we need to do is we need to make an array of elephants. So we say Q2 elephant um, like that equals um, e or RTM, we often say RTM for return, equals new Q2 elephant. How big is it going to be? Well, we know both names and age are the same size now because we just checked a moment ago to make sure they're the same size. So we can just say names.length. .length. So our new array is going to be the size of these two other arrays. Okay, so we've now made ourselves an array. Then we'll do a for loop and go through every element of, of that new elephant array and set the elephants um, and create an elephant for each one of these. Because remember, at that point, all we've done is created an array of references to elephants. We haven't made any elephants yet. We've just made references to elephants and they're all gonna be null to start with. So let's go through. So for int i equals zero, i is less than, uh, what is it, the names dot length? Yep, dot length, um, i plus plus. Now for each one of these, we're gonna create a new elephant, okay? So we'll say, um, RT n uh, i, so it's this element of the array, equals a new Q2 elephant. And what's it going to have? It's, we need to call its constructor, which is going to be what? Um, the name followed by the age. So we just say names for i, because we're going through all the names and all the ages together, and ages dot uh, i. There you go. We've now in initialized each one of those with an elephant. And we'll just say return. Um, Return RTN, great. And then uh, we'll, we'll run the test, but we won't wait for the results, we'll keep them working, because now what we need to do is to write a two-string method. And, and it tells us exactly what here. It says return a string describing the age in the format name, elephant, name, age, years old. Okay, so we've got to replace the name with the actual name and age with the actual age. So we'll do this, we'll say elephant, fat, um, and then a space, and then a plus a, uh, name, not age. Um, plus um, a space is, and then a space, and then we'll say plus age. Remember, this is not really plus, this is concatenate. Um, is that, and then what is it? Years old, space, years old. Just like that, there's no full stop. Nope. All right, um, so hopefully we're done now. We've, we've, did, we've done the two string, and, and look, our test factory passed. 
So I, I don't now remember, maybe Leo can go check Piazza, but I don't remember exactly what the question was about elephant, but I'm hoping now, I think it had to do with this part here, but I'm hoping that the person who asks a question about elephant can see the answer to their question here and the way I solved that problem. And the basic thing there was I created an array of elephant references. These are just the references to the elephants. Then that's not the actual elephants. Then here I went through a loop and for each one of these, I made a new elephant whose name was equal to the ith element in the name array and its age was equal to ith element in the ages array. And I stepped through that one at a time. And we're done. So now, um, unless there's a question on that, I'm gonna move on to the jigsaw puzzle because someone asked about this on Piazza as well. Let's move through this. Now, one thing you'll notice is that there's some similarity here with your assignment, okay? So we're talking about pieces of puzzle in a game. So the problem's concerned with the placement of pieces in a simple jigsaw puzzle played on a five by five board. There are five types of piece, O through four. Notice they're in quotes, and that implies that it's a character zero and up to the character four. Um, there are 25 piece locations, O, O through to two, four. That's how they're encoded, I guess. And then there are four orientations, north, east, south, and west. I did write this question, but it was a year ago, so I've forgotten how it works. Your advice to implement the missing code in the order given. Notice it's giving you advice there. Follow the advice. Okay, be sure to take into account piece orientation. Yeah, so the orientation of the pieces is important, apparently. We don't know why yet, because we only just started reading the question. Return true if the piece string represents a well-formed piece placement. To be well-formed, the piece must contain exactly four characters. Right, first thing we do is put in a test to make sure uh, it's got four characters. We, we know that, we can, that's a good start. So if piece dot um, um, length, length is not equal to four, then, we, then what are we supposed to do? Well, we return false because it's not well formed. Um, it's not equal to four, then return false. Okay, so we're, we're doing the easy stuff first. We just, you know, it says here it's got to be exactly four characters. So if it's not four characters, bang, we're done. And then it says a digit describing the piece type. So this should be a digit going from zero to four. Okay, and um, there are lots of ways of doing this. Um, but you could just say, um, mm, there are many ways of doing this. So let's just look at the first one. So that's going to be a char, okay? So we, we can we can just say um, so. Let's check check that first thing first, okay? And so we got to do, use the char out to get that character zero. So we'll do that, um, and then we'll say um, we can do something like this. What what shall we do? I'm making this up, folks. Um, we'll say uh, we'll, we can convert the char um, into uh, yes. Let's let's just do this char t for type, right? Um, equals um, uh, piece dot get char, char at and then we want to get the char at position what um, zero okay so we're getting the, the, the character at position zero and then what we want to do is make sure that that is equal to a character between zero and four so we can say um, if t is less than t is a char less than zero or, whoops, or t is greater than four, then return false, because it's not well formed. Okay, just like that. So that's that first one. Then we've got two digits forming an integer for the piece location. Okay, so one thing we wanna do is make sure they are actually digits. They could be any digit. Well, that, that one there can only be zero, one, or two, but the other one could be anything. So let's just, just check that they're all digits first, okay? We can use that with the, um, the character thing. We can say, um, we can say if um, character dot is digit, yep, if it's not a digit, right? Um, then we'll say uh, piece dot char at one. So we're going to get that first one and say if it's not a digit, then we're done, right? Or um, oh, sorry, piece dot dot um, get char at one is what I meant to write. Okay, so we're going to get that get that first that one at position number one, which should be this guy, and say if it's not a digit, then we're done, right? And then we'll say um, likewise, or if this is not a digit, that the one that follows it is not a digit. Um, then we say um, piece dot char at um, two dot char at two. Uh, if that's um, not a digit, then we return false, okay? Because um, one of those two digits, one of those two characters is not a digit, then, then, then that's clearly no good, all right? So then um, we now know they're both digits. What we can now do is we can say, um, 
we can get an integer from a we can get an integer from a string, right? You all know that. We can say int. Um, what is it called? It's the location. We'll call int l equals integer dot parse um, int, and we'll say um, piece dot substring, and then we'll say one comma um, three. I've always got to remember, is it inclusive or exclusive? It's inclusive of the first and exclusive of the second. All right, so now we've got ourselves a, a, a number L, and we're going to say, is that L, um, it's got to be between 0 and 24. And we'll say, if L is less than, <laughs> less than 0, which it can't really be because we know there's no dashes in there, but anyway, we can just write that for fun. If it's less than that, let me say, or greater than 24, Right, and it's 20, I was thinking, why is it 24? That's because there's 25 places and it's one less of 25. So if it's greater than 24 or less than zero, then we return false because it's not well formed. Okay, and finally, we've got to make sure that the, uh, this last thing is an orientation. It's got to be north, east, south, or west. And now we can just write return that, that the lot, we can just say char, char o for orientation equals um, piece dot substring dot char at three and then we'll say um, we'll say uh, return o equals um, n or o equals north south o equals east it's gonna be one of those and if it isn't one of those it's not well formed. Okay, so I think we're done with that. That's a well formed piece placement. Uh, where are we? Jigsaw test. Notice this is taking longer than the other two. Okay, and we're nearly we're nearly on the hour. I'm going to keep going with this, folks. I'm going to keep going with this one here because I'd like to see you finish it. We've already got half marks. Um, okay, test. Um, what's this one? Test PP. Yeah. Okay, I think we're good. Um, yep. So we we passed this test here. So we we passed that one. Now let's move on to the next one. Well formed puzzle string. Okay, so to be well-formed, it has to be comprised up to 25 well-formed piece placements and have no more than five of any kind and have o no overlapping pieces. Okay, so there are a couple of ideas here. First of all, we need to bust this thing into fours, right? Because everyone is, everyone is done in, in um, four, piece, four um, units of four. So we're going to say, um, we can say something like this. Um, uh, four um, int i equals zero, i is less than puzzle dot length. Um, i is less than puzzle dot length. Um, i plus plus. Um, we're going to step through here. Now, um, well, first of all, we can make sure that um, it has to be multiple four. And it has to be greater than zero, and it has to not be null. If any of those things are true, then it's not going to work. So let's just write that down. It doesn't say that in the question, but we know that. We can imply that because if it, any of those were true, that clearly wouldn't be. Okay, so let's just write that. So we'll say puzzle equals null, null, or puzzle dot length is um, equals zero, or the integer remainder of the puzzle length when we divide by four is not equal to zero, then it's not, um, any of those things are true, then it's, it's not a well-formed puzzle piece. Okay, so we'll return false. And once we've done that, we know we can safely step through here. And incidentally, we don't want to increment i by one, we want to increment i by four, because now we know plus equals four, because now we know that the number of characters in this string is a multiple of four. We just checked it up here, and we know it should be, because each piece has got a size four. Right, so, so now we know that that's true, we can step through here. Okay, so we're gonna step through this um, puzzle, step by step, um, and then what we can do is we can take each substring out of there as we go along and just check that it's a well-formed piece. There's some other stuff we need to do first, but we'll do this first, okay? So when I say string piece equals um, puzzle dot substring, uh, substring i comma i plus four. Right, and then we can say if um, not well formed 
puzzle piece placement, P, then if it's not well formed, then we're done. So we say return false. Okay. And, um, oops, I didn't say return here. If any of those things are true, we return false. Okay. Um, but if we did get that, then we know at least we've got a well-formed puzzle piece. So if we pass all this stuff, we have a well-formed puzzle piece, all right? But there's two other things we need to check. We've got to make sure that there's um, a, a no more than 25. So we can check here for the length. It's got to be um, um, or puzzle.length dot length is greater than 100 because uh, 4 times 25 is 100. So if it's greater than 100, then we know we've made a mistake. So we'll put that in there. So now we know it's definitely got the right number. It's, it's definitely no more than 25. And we've got to check that for each piece kind, there are only um, no more than five. So the way we can do that is we can create an array. How many piece kinds are there? It tells us up the type. There are um, five of them. Okay, so let's create an array of piece kind. Um, where is it? Sorry, here, piece kind for, um, where, where am I? Piece kind. So we say um, int array k equals um, new int 5. Okay, let's just change its name to PKC, PKC, piece kind count. Okay, that's counting up how many piece kinds there are. Um, we know here it's uh, after we, if we get through to here, then we know we've got a well well formed piece. So we can grab the piece kind from here. We can say um, char k equals p dot char at zero. That's the first character is telling us that, and we want to um, subtract um, the number zero from it minus um, zero. Okay, uh, and we need to force it to be a char because um, there we are. Okay, so we're subtracting the ASCII code from zero from whatever was in position zero. So if it was zero, and then we subtract zero, we get the number zero. If it was one, because we know one comes next in the character sequence, it will get one minus zero, which is equal to one and so forth. So this is essentially, we can actually turn this into an int um, if we want, like that. All right, so now we've, uh, we know what kind it is. And then we can say this, we can say piece kind count um, if, Steve, yeah, Leo. Just point out the error in your code. So it should be uh, using remainder, not uh, division. Oh, heck yeah! Thank you. Someone just pointed out that there's a that that should have been integer remainder, not division. Yeah, absolutely right. Okay. And now, if the Leo scared the heck out of me there, I was deep in my own little world, and Leo Leo's voice came out of my laptop. All right. Um, now, if the piece kind count for this thing is already equal to, what does it say? No more than, what is it? No more than five equals five. Then we return false because we've got too many pieces. Okay. Um, otherwise, else, piece, else, um, piece kind count for K uh, plus plus. We increment it. So we're adding up how many there are. Now, finally, what we need to do is going to be no overlapping pieces. All right. So what we need to do now is take the position and check whether something's there. So what we can do is we know how many positions there are. There's 25 positions. We can make a Boolean array. Boolean um, uh, taken equals new Boolean. So now I've got a little Boolean for every piece in the puzzle. And then what I can do is the same kind of thing. So that there is checking out the kind. Now check, check location. Thanks for spotting that error, by the way. It would have been really annoying to debug in a few minutes time. Um, now we're going to check the location. So now we want to do the same sort of thing. Just like we did up here, we already know that um, we can just pinch that code, since we already wrote it. We know that this is a sound piece, uh, that, the, that the piece is properly formatted, right? Oh, we've we'll called it P here, because we're being very stingy with our letters. Okay, so there, we already knew that the substring one to three is actually digits, because we know it's a, a well-formed piece placement. So we can just use parseInt 
and um, grab those characters, turn them into integer, and we've got the location. And then we can do a similar thing. We can say if taken L, then return false. That means someone's already in that place. Okay, else um, taken L equals true, <laughs> equals true. All right, so check the kind, check the location. And if we got all our way through here, we're done. It actually worked. So let's just see if that actually, we actually did the thing here. Run the jigsaw test. And I didn't get around to doing the next thing. I'm gonna keep plowing on. You all can um, leave. Please honestly feel free to leave if you, if you need to. Um, oh, what's happened here? That one should have worked. Uh, what happened here? Got true for false for an empty string. Oh, okay. It's supposed to return true. Empty string is supposed to be true. All right. So um, if, that's strange. I think everything will just work actually. Let's just see. Because if it's empty, we'll just fall through this loop. If it's a little of length zero. Uh, nope, what's happened now? Um, it says expected true, we got false. Expected true, why did it say false? Puzzle length zero should be zero. Puzzle is zero. Um, I don't know why that's happening. Puzzle string, empty string. Hmm. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is just say if um, puzzle dot length, I, I'm confused here, um, but that means it's an empty string, which is the case that is being tested down here. Let's just run that and see if that, that solved it. I would have thought this code would just fall out neat. Uh, apparently not, still got a problem here. Okay, what are we doing wrong here? Puzzle string, empty string, um, we expected true, but we got false. Unless of course it's inverted. Um, what's happened here? Click to see the difference. Okay. Okay, expect to see true. Um, all right, expects true. Goodness. Um, all right. We can just say puzzle dot equals empty string. <laughs> all right, we're explicitly checking for that and returning it. Um, maybe there's something there I'm not thinking of. Let's just do this in two steps. We know that we have to check that first. We'll return false for that. Okay. And then we'll check this. By the way, folks, if anyone can see why that didn't work, just yell at me. I'd be interested to see because I can't quite see what I did wrong there. Try again. And it's still not working. What have I done wrong here, folks? Um, oh no. Okay, expected true, but got false for this string here. Okay, all right, so we now, ha now have another problem here. Uh, uh, Steve, yep. I, I think, sorry, I was just reading uh, multiple compositions in the in the chat. They point out that you uh, typed it wrong, so it should be not equal to zero, but you typed it equal to zero. Oh, where's that? So, uh, the, uh, line 56, I believe. Sorry, just give me a second. Um, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, and that explains why everything was not working. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, thank you for that. You can see that, that I've made two mistakes there. Okay, so when I wrote that down, I, I, did it too, I made two mistakes in that one thing, and that killed me. All right, thank you for that. All right, so, and I, and I didn't even recheck it. I didn't go back and check that, which is what I should have done. I should have checked, rechecked that line of code there. Okay, so we've got that working. Now what we need to do is uh, find the uh, next, okay, and yeah, what's simple piece placement? Because piece is null. Well formed piece placement, line 29. Um, okay. Uh, is that the code we just wrote? <laughs> yeah, we should check for, for null first, okay? If um, P 
pace equals null, well, we can just write it in here. Okay, so we, we got burned there by a null. Someone put a null piece in here and that blew it up. Let's just run that again. We should get through that one there, simple piece placement. I didn't notice that error before. Okay, great, we've got three out of four. Now let's just go to next. This is the part that I think someone was asking about. Sorry, it's taking me so long to get here. Um, and what we're gonna do here is return the position that is next in the given side of a piece when the piece is in a particular orientation. Okay, so we assume a five by five board. Assume the sides of the piece are encoded this way. Top is zero, right is one, bottom is two, left is three. Aha, okay, assume the piece orientation is upright, rotated, 90 clockwise, upside down, rotated. Okay, this is interesting because what we can do is we can add those two things together and then do um, remainder arithmetic or modulus arithmetic. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to return the position that is next to a given side of a piece. All right, so first of all, um, um, minus one if the adjacent piece is off the board. So um, now we've got a position, which is gonna be one of those positions there, and we've got a side and an orientation. So the um, next, the, the direction of the next one is going to be, we can actually do some very simple math here, I think we can just say int um, nxt equals side plus orientation, it's like going around a clock, okay? So if the side is two and the orientation is zero, then it's, it's two. But if the orientation is one, that's another 90 degrees, so it's gonna be three and so forth. So we can just add these together and do a remainder arithmetic. Um, so we just call this dir, okay? So dir equals side plus orientation. Okay, we can just do that and then take the integer a remainder of four and I'll see if I can actually type it right this time, sorry. So this is also a lesson in making sure you're well slept before you do an exam. I've, I'm not well slept, I'm making a lot of mistakes today. All right, so here we are. So we've, we've done that. So now we know the direction. And then depending on, on um, where we are, we need to do additional subtraction to move, okay? So what we can do is we can calculate our row and our column based on our position, right? The position's here, right? We can calculate the row and the column. Um, and so we can say um, int r equals um, position, um, Yep, divided by five, right? So that tells us which row we're in. Int column equals position integer remainder five, right? Like that. Okay, so we've got the row and the column. And now what we need to do is, um, uh, okay, so then we need to add and subtract depending on the direction we're going and whether we're on the edge of the board, okay? So now let's just do a, a very um, simple, um, uh, we can do a switch statement if you like. We can do a switch statement on the direction. We can say um, switch. We could also do this with if statements. Switch dir, um, and then we can go case um, case zero. If we if the direction is zero, we'll put a break in here before we forget. If the direction is zero, um, so which direction was zero? That's upright. It's at the top. It means we're going upwards. Then um, we're going to return. Um, one row up, so it's minus five from our location. So have a look here. So if we're here, we subtract five, we get to seven. So we're gonna go subtract five unless we're in the top row. So we return um, row equals zero. If we're in the top row, we return, what do we return if we're off the board? Minus one. Otherwise, we return our loc position minus five, okay? Um, and that break statement's useless, fair enough. Okay, so then we can do case one, which is going to the right. And now we're gonna to have to check if we're off the board, which means that we need to be, if we're in column number four, then we might be off the board, okay? So return C equals four, then minus one, because it means if we go to the right from column four, we're gonna go off the board, right? Um, and we'll say position plus one, right? So if we go, go right on this, this thing here, it's just incrementing by one, like that. So we can just do it like that. Um, and case um, two, that's going down, we're gonna say return. And again, we need to make sure we don't go off the board. So we see if our row is equal to the bottom row, which is four, then we off the board by going down. So we return, otherwise we return position plus of the row, the length of the row, which is five, because there's five elements in every row, have, have a look again. So if we're here and we go down, we go plus five, right? 
And then finally, um, case five, uh, case three, um, we return R equals, if R is equal, oh no, no, if the column is zero, because we're going that way now, case three is going, going left, so column is equal to zero, then we're off the board, because if we go left from column zero, we're off the board. Otherwise, um, position minus one, right? If you look, if you go left foot on any position here, you're going backwards by one, all right? So we just have to take care that we don't wrap off the board, and we're done. And that should cover all cases, if we're lucky. Let's just give that a test. I don't know if I missed anything. I need more coffee. I still have coffee in my cup, that's my problem. All right, great, folks. Look, I'm sorry I ran out of time there, um, but what we've done here today is we've, start, uh, we've started off in the exam. I've stepped through three simple questions. Um, there's two, uh, one simple question, one slightly harder question, and one medium difficulty question. You saw me make a mistake. Um, let me go through the mistakes I made. I think I only made one, uh, one double, double mistake here, and that is here. I said divide by four equals zero. What I should have said is integer remainder four is not equal to zero, and that caused me a bunch of grief. Um, other than that, we got through here. Hopefully, you got a sense of how I solved it, and hopefully you understood the point that you should always try and grab the low-hanging fruit. Solve the simple task first. Be satisfied when you get one or two check tests passing because you're making progress at that point, okay? And if needs be, upload it, push, and, and commit. Now, uh, Leo, we're going to finish up, but are there any outstanding questions there? Did anyone have anything else they wanted to ask? Uh, actually, no. Uh, I think I only got one here. Why didn't why did you didn't use break statement there? Ah, why didn't I use break statement? Yeah, I didn't use break. I, I tried to. Look, if I put the break in, it's a good question. Why didn't I use break? Right? And look, there's a squiggly line. Let's have a look at what it says. It's a really good question. The person asked a good question there. Why didn't I use a break statement? Come on. Okay, see what it says? I don't know if you can read that. It says unreachable statement. That means that IntelliJ is smart enough to realize that at this line, we return from the program, okay? If this is true, we return that. If that's true, return that. Either way, we're done. We're out of here. We're out of this, um, out of this method, not from the program. And so whatever we put here will never get executed. And therefore, it is an unreachable statement. And it's saying, don't put that there, okay? So, um, but it's a great question because normally we do put breaks in and if you go back and watch the video, you'll see I did put a break in there and then I realized um, that IntelliJ was being clever and telling me I, I shouldn't put it there. For that reason, I just explained it's not necessary. Okay, any other questions? All right, folks. Um, with that, I'm going to leave you. Please make sure, let's just go back again to these slides, to these, um, these slides here. Tech check. 9 p.m. Sunday and 9 a.m. Monday. You only need to go to one. We've got two there just because people are in funny time zones. So you just need to go one or the other. You don't have to go to both. Self-invigilation. Make sure you read about that on the course webpage and make sure you do it and make sure you test it during the tech check. And finally, the exams at one o'clock uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time on Monday. All right. Um, have a great weekend. And um, remember also, finally, just last thing. Remember this exam here, don't expect to get uh, 20 out of 20 for this exam. Very few people will. You can see it's hard to get through the whole thing in the, in the time available. That's on purpose, okay? It should be possible for the vast majority of the people of this class to pass it, okay? And that's what I'm looking for. So I hope you all will pass it, okay? But um, don't expect to get a HD, okay? Because un unless you're, you're um, really going, going really well, okay? But have a great uh, break and uh, have a great weekend, I mean. We've got a break coming up in a week. Have a great weekend. And um, I'll catch up with you on Monday.